because there's been a few people messaging me about some ridiculous stuff that's being said about red meat and the possibility that it can bring on diabetes. Let me just show you a headline, actually, uh, which I think you might find interesting, which is from April 2023. And it was in the Guardian newspaper, British doctor pioneers low-carb diet as cure for obesity and type 2 diabetes. And Dr. David Unwin is this person that they're talking about, a great guy. And if you look into what's been said here, that within one year of a low-carb diet, 77% of the patients had gone into remission, which is pretty good numbers, actually. So that's strange, isn't it? Because you always thought that, hmm. If you read the Harvard report, maybe you wouldn't think this is possible. You see, diabetes, I'm a specialist practitioner in obesity and diabetes, is not a problem with the metabolism of protein. It's actually a problem with the metabolism of carbohydrates, your blood glucose and your insulin and how it all works. So, for instance, when I was doing my studies, I kept putting my hand up and saying, Every time you talk about dosing with insulin, it's always in relation to carbohydrates. Now, I don't know if you know much about red meat, but red meat doesn't tend to have a lot of carbohydrate. In fact, it's mainly protein, animal fats and water. And to think that that could possibly, possibly cause any onset of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, I just can't see the mechanism. Also, I like to use my eyes and brain. So I've been coaching uh, the carnivore lifestyle for five years and low carb for over 10. During that time, I've never had a client develop type 2 diabetes. But I've certainly had over 100 come to me and say that they have type 2 diabetes and they're looking to manage it and hopefully reverse it. And that has happened 100% of the time, uh, 100% of the time. So they've got off their medications, they've started to manage their blood glucose, and they don't require any insulin. They don't require any medications. So that's really odd, isn't it? So my numbers aren't great. I know this study is talking about 200,000 200, plus people. But is this study any good? Well, firstly, it's not a clinical study. It's not a randomized clinical trial. If you are looking to diagnose someone with diabetes, you do some bloods. As a qualified phlebotomist, I've done hundreds, if not thousands of bloods. I was qualified to do uh, take blood even for the NHS if I wanted to, but I was doing private blood tests. Now, how do you diagnose someone with diabetes? Well, apart from clinical presentation, uh, lots of thirst and urination, you would look at their HbA1c, which is a rough average of how much glycation there is in the hemoglobin of the red blood cells over a three-month period or maybe 90 days. And you would also look at their fasting blood glucose. And you would also look at their fasting insulin. You may even look at their C-peptide, which is directly coming from the beta cells in the pancreas, which is a proxy marker for how much insulin is being made. So out of these 200,000 people, did they have these bloods taken? No, that definitely is not what happened. In fact, every two years for some and once every four years, they were sent a fruit frequency questionnaire and they were asked to say what did they eat now i have actually volunteered in the past to be part of one of these studies and i can tell you when you get to the food question and i'm very lucky because i was looking to do a clinical trial where you stay overnight or over the weekend and i had to be asked the questions about food and the button for red meat does not di differentiate between red meat that comes from a grass-fed steak or red meat that's ending up on top of a pizza in a sandwich or in a lasagna. So this study that we're looking at that's getting all this traction 
is basically looking at lasagna, <laughs> sandwiches, and pizzas, not grass-fed ribeye steaks. Now, I didn't have a ribeye steak until I was 55. Up until age 49, I followed the food guidelines. I did not have a ribeye. I did not have red meat. I did not eat animal fats. I was following the food guidelines. I did not smoke. I did not drink. And I was trying to eat healthy. I was eating fruit and veg. And I was also exercising. I was a personal trainer. I did not smoke. I did not drink. This is called healthy user bias because I was actually health conscious. And yet this way of eating meant that I was getting tubbier and I had lower left quadrant pain and I had a coronary artery calcium scan of 639. Also, I was pre-diabetic. So from my own experience, I know that not eating red meat and not eating animal fat and following the WHO guidelines did not work for me. And it was only when I went low carb much like Dr. David Unwin, which was mentioned in The Guardian in April 2023. Once I went low carb, I started to see remission of all these problems. Fast forward to here I am at age 59, and all those problems are long, long gone. As we know, you can prove anything by association if you're quite clever with your stats. Now, the most common ones I hear are Rates of suicide going up every time Nicolas Cage releases a movie. That's been shown on a website called Dubious Associations. And you can prove with an association, proof being a very flexible word, that that is an association. You see, association doesn't really mean anything. It's just saying, look at this. More of this might equal more of this but it doesn't actually prove a cause and effect. You cannot do that. You cannot say there is a cause and effect. When you do look at this paper, and let's assume then that the food frequency questionnaire wasn't dubious, and the fact that it was only once every four years that most people answer the question, and it is only an association, and there is no mechanism, and they haven't taken any bloods, let's forget all that and actually look at risk which is a cause and effect statement, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say, well, the risk, what is it? Well, it's 1.5, but it's not an absolute risk. It's a relative risk. So this is a crazy way of looking at risk. You need the absolute risk. And for those people that don't really know, if you have 100,000 people and let's say um, three people get diabetes and they're eating red meat, and those that aren't eating red meat is two people, well, the absolute risk is very minuscule. It's, it's 0, 0.00 whatever. But the difference between three and two, even though it's 100,000 people and it's only three and two, you could say, wow, it's a 30% difference. And that's the sort of jiggery-pokery that this sort of study actually does seem to want to revel in. The other thing is, what about studies that say the complete reverse? Well, there's plenty of those too. I mean, this study here, results of this meta-analysis suggest red meat intake does not impact on glycemic and insulin risk factors for type 2 diabetes. This is a very well-respected study too. Well, let's ignore that. Let's have a look at the authors of this study. We can just click on any of their names and we can find out, are there any conflicts of interest? Now, Walter Willett, yes, here is definitely somebody that has multiple serious potential conflicts of interest, which cast doubt on his ability to bring an unbiased viewpoint to the question of whether a vegan vegetarian diet is preferable for good health. Absolutely. All these links, by the way, are in the uh, description. In the last few years, Willett's direction directorship of Harvard T.S. Chan School of Public Health, the school received $455,000 and $1.5 million from companies or groups interested in promoting vegetarian products or vegetarian diets generally. So if you're getting £1.5 million for your department because you're promoting 
a vegetarian or vegan diet, do you think that your study is going to say it's not a good way of eating? No, I don't think that's going to happen. So I just want to really summarize. Firstly, my real world experience with hundreds of clients is that none of them None of them have ever developed type 2 diabetes. And what are the odds of that when you're talking over 500 people over five years? Not one. And actually 10 years when you look at low carb, not one. But everyone that's had type 2 diabetes, 100% of them have had a remission. Also, it's just impossible to think of any mechanism where this would be a problem. Because diabetes is not a problem when it comes to protein metabolism or fat metabolism. It is all about carbohydrate metabolism and high levels of glucose. I think everybody knows that. So it is a ridiculous study, an absolute ridiculous study. And that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Um, I wanted to show you that if you want a real good takedown, then you could look at Dr. Zoe Harkham's um, takedown of this study, where she has basically gone through every single thing and found multiple problems absolutely multiple problems. I think there were something like 14 issues. And I would say that that is definitely worth a click and uh, a look. So that was, that was it. That was, uh, that's basically what I wanted to say.